In this episode, we will be interviewing Daniel Zhu, the founder of Stance Elements, which is now the largest breaking and open styles dance media platform in the world. In it, we will cover how he built Stance from zero to its millions of collective followers in just seven years and what he did to get there, how he even got into breaking and dance, his time as a Peace Corps member and an Alaskan park ranger, what? And how that shaped him, his Olympics dream project, and his insight on the future of breaking and dance. Welcome to the Movement Media Mentor Podcast, the show where we help movement artists, dancers, and creators share their greatest movements through advice and stories on media and video creation. Daniel, man of many powers and many platforms, but continuing to hold it down for the breaking movement, competitive dancing. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me on this podcast, Kai. Of course, man, dude. It's, it's, yeah. been a, it's been a long time coming. And I think this is finally a good moment to have you because you have been someone that, well, I've been working with for almost four or five years now. You've taught me a lot. You've given me a lot of opportunities and I'm super grateful for you. And I think you have a lot of stories to share because your face, Daniel, is not typically something that people see when they are knowing of stance or consuming your content or even understanding what you do and the work you put out. So this is definitely a rare occasion and I appreciate you for making the time to come out here. And so I wanted to ask you a few questions about your journey and how you even got stance elements to get started because a lot of people think, and you know this, a lot of people think that stance is a very big company with a lot of members that makes a lot of money and has a lot of X, Y, and Z. But in reality, when you flip it around, you go into our group chat, there is like less than 10 active people and you can tell like all the different balls you're juggling. And in fact, this is not the case. It's, it's very, very, it's very different from the out inside than it looks from the outside. I'm sure you can attest to that. But before we get into that, which we will, I do want to ask you about how you even got started to create stance and, and what your journey to making your own platform began. How did you, how did that happen for you? Uh, Stance started in 2014. Mm -hmm. uh, it's It was a group of friends. Um, a lot of us worked as part of Strife TV prior to that, and we left Strife TV to create a ch channel, a production company of our own. And that's what we created, you know, with Stance. We, we took a lot of the lessons and, you know, tips that we learned through our experience with Strife, and we're like, let's let's change some things around, and that's how our brand started. Right. So how about for you? I'm curious. Sorry, I'm going to turn the light on because I totally forgot to. Boom. If you're not watching the visual, check it on YouTube. But if not, the audio is going to be fine. I'm curious about you, Dan, because the way you, from, from what I know, your story starting stance is there's quite a few layers to it. There are steps. You didn't immediately just start a company. You worked your way from another company and then you even had to get into breaking somehow. And I actually don't really know the full story behind that. And you have a lot of interesting history even before that. So... I am curious, maybe let's start from when you first discovered breaking and how that kind of led you on the journey to start stance. Let's hear about that. I, okay, so I first started breaking in 2000. Oh. Wow. I, was a, I was a freshman in college mm. and I had a summer internship, summer internship in Washington, D.C. And I saw they had um, an arts festival and uh, they had an advertisement for a workshop by Lions of Zion. Mm. So I went to that. I had no idea what was going on. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm originally from South Dakota. We didn't have breaking. So <laughs> I was like, you know, but I was curious. So I went. I didn't have many friends in D.C., so I thought that was interesting. I, you know, I was taking the workshop in Doc Martens. I didn't, oh, my well, gosh. <laughs> I was not planning on going to a, a dance workshop, but it was happening that afternoon, mm -hmm. and I was there. It's like, screw it. I'm already there. Okay. And so that was fun. You know, I still know uh, some of the people that – you know, did the workshop. I'm, I'm friends with them. I tell them all the time, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, and then a year later, my university started its very first breaking club Oh, at University of Wisconsin. Okay. So d these were other breakers? that These were other breakers, beginner breakers. We didn't know much, um, but we wanted to learn. And we started our first ever breaking club in 2002. Oh, dang. And I just hung out with them. Uh, we learned. And then uh, one of the breakers, his name was B-Boy Man of God, who definitely had more, much more experience than us. He's from Chicago. 
and he's one of my best friends. Oh, you okay. know, we've been together for so long. He lives currently lives out in Hong Kong right now. Oh wow! And you know, just one thing led to another. We just got you know, it just increased our curiosity. First major dance event we've ever been to was called City vs City Three in Chicago. And, uh, Did you battle? Did I battle? No, bro. Uh, <laughs> it was an invite. It was like uh, okay, it was okay. like New York, the best of New York versus the best of Boston versus the best of Chicago. Got you. Like we were first year students from Wisconsin. <laughs> we were like, no. But that was like your first exposure to an event? <laughs> to a big event. Oh, okay. And it was my first exposure to video because uh, after like a couple months later, we saw the highlight trailer and I was like, whoa, this is pretty, I was there too. This is pretty badass. Mm. Whoever made this highlight trailer, his name is Coney Rock. Um, I was like, well, okay, this is pretty cool. Yeah. I had, and that caught my interest too. It was like, I want to film like that. Is that video online? What's it called? City versus City Three trailer. Okay, so, so that was kind of like the video to start it off. It is online. It's pretty good, and okay. you'll notice immediately it's different than most B Boy trailers mm, because okay. it uh, it did one of my favorite things was capture audience reactions. Ah, uh, yeah, okay, that is different. It'll show a cool yeah. move, but then it'll show like a face just th their face is just totally like in awe. Yeah, and I I like that. Yes. That's awesome. Okay, so continue. So after you went to the events, then how was the rest of your college experience, at least related to breaking? Our college experience, yeah. you know, uh, we got more into breaking. Mm -hmm. We started organizing small events at my university. You know, our, my friend Jarius, he started organizing mm -hmm. big events. We had a big one called Breaking the Law, which lasted many, many years. He got, like, big crews to come. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I graduated early. I graduated. Oh. Um and you know, I traveled the world. When I, you know, my major was in international relations. So um, I, I joined the Peace Corps. I went to lived in Africa. Um, I was a perk ranger in Alaska. Jeez. Um, <laughs> but I mean, if you want to fast forward and fast forward all that stuff, no, I still I love think, breaking. Yeah, I don't think so. I think that's so super interesting. Let's touch on that. How did you even? <laughs> what well, What was the decision? Like, how did you make that? Was it Was it very obvious to you that you wanted to join the Peace Corps out of school? Yeah. Wow. Easy. Why? why? Um, okay, so my, 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 I studied international relations. For me, my dream job would be to work in an embassy. Mm. U.S. embassy, U.S. consulate, something like that, that, you know, you, you can, foreign service was, was great. Gotcha. And the path for foreign service would be either, in my opinion, what, back then was you either be a Peace Corps volunteer or you join the military. Uh, having 911 you know, Bush invading Afghanistan, Iraq since then, I was like, I'll do the Peace Corps part. Right. Uh, and so I lived in Africa. Wow, that's yeah. crazy, man. Oh, that, that's true. You were in school when that happened, huh? Yeah. Wow. That happened near university, yeah. Jeez. Okay, that's crazy. So then that compelled you to do that. How did you end up becoming a park ranger? Uh, so I lived in Africa for three years, and uh, my first job after the Peace Corps was um, I was looking for, like, where can I work? that involves outdoors and speaking French, because I, I learned French in Africa. French, okay. And then I saw a job posting for like a park ranger in US Park Service in Alaska. It was like, French speaking park ranger. So I said, all right, I'm applying. Wow. I applied. <laughs> and, and, so, and so, yes, I spoke French. There's a lot of French speaking uh, uh, people from France and Canadians that go to you know national parks. So they need a French speaking park ranger and I was there. That's crazy. How long were you there for? Uh, in Alaska? Yeah. Two years. Two years. Wow. Yeah. My gosh. Okay. So you majored in international relations. Yes. And so I've been wondering for the longest time, just as someone who sees like where you're at now, you know, like running stance and everything. When you told me that, I was just like, wait, how is that related to any of this? You know, I was like thinking about it. And, and then when you mentioned, you know, you wanted to work in an embassy, you know, you wanted to be a foreign consulate and like, and bring you know people together i feel like that's definitely a huge strength of yours which we'll get into more which is like talking to people and like inviting people to new things and and going to new places and introducing new ideas right you're, you're essentially doing that on like a widespread scale mm -hmm. in the dance and movement world that's that's amazing i, I want to go back to that but i want to allow you to continue your story so after you do both the peace corps and the park ranger work then what happens next? So after Peace Corps in Africa, after Park Ranger in Alaska, you know, I was like, you know, Alaska just got kind of lonely. There's nothing else going on. Dark winters. I was like, I, I, I was like, I, I miss dancing. You know, there's sometimes and I was like, I'll be on like a, a bear viewing platform in Alaska just for like three hours. Nothing else. No bears because it'd be, 
it'll be like March, and uh, I'll, all I'll be just doing is like practicing top rock or something, just <laughs> just because I was just so bored. And so I applied for a uh, I just taught I applied for a job teaching English in South Korea. Mm-hmm. Got you. And you know South Korea at that time, the late two thousands, is like the place to be, right? Mm-hmm. Like R sixteen, and it was like gamblers had their own studio rivers had their own studio i was like i want to go there Jeez. Yeah, and so the peak or like yeah so i just went, i just left it went to korea and like first week i went to like gambler studio to practice second week i went to this place to practice and and then that's how i got back into breaking mm, again okay and my friends out in the usa they created who created strife tv like a month prior to me moving to korea they're like Oh, they're, by the way, my friends who created Strife TV are also from my university. Oh. They're also from University of Wisconsin. Oh, okay, Like, from the same breaking club. Same, like, so you guys were in school at the same time? Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. And they were film majors. I wasn't. Wow. Who would have thought so that? So they were like, yeah. Dan, do you, um, do you have a camera? I'm like, no, but I can get one. Why? <laughs> do you want to film for our channel called Strife? I'm like, sure. I'm in Korea. All right. I'm, I... <laughs> So so there it was, just filming like local Korean events. That's crazy. Who would have who would have thought that I guess like the backbone of breaking and, and dance media it, it originated from the University of Wisconsin of all places. Originally from Wisconsin. Yes. So, Seriously. Yep. I mean it just goes to show you guys, like I guess it's, it doesn't truly matter where you are, because, I mean you even you don't have to be in Los Angeles to make things happen, you know? So that, that's that's pretty incredible story. So you get to South Korea, you start filming battles, and how is that starting out? Because, you know, this is your first time you've held a camera. So what's the journey like? Was it pretty easy to start just filming events, or did did you kind of have to, was there a learning curve? I had no filming background or video editing background. I didn't know what I was doing. I just pressed record. I didn't know about focusing. My first camera was like a flip camera. Okay. It was like a 720p flip camera. <laughs> <laughs> but... I was there, you know, so I just did it and it was fun. You know, nowadays people know me, but back then no one knew me. I mean, I was on stage for um, this event called Jonju and um, our mutual friend John J. Chon was mm. also on stage and he looked at me and he was like, yo, who the fuck are you? <laughs> <laughs> he, literally, he literally said that. Oh my God. That's really funny because I can't picture John just saying that right now. And I was like, hi, I'm, I'm Dan. That's funny. That's <laughs> fucking hilarious. I'm filming this for Strife TV. Did he know what Strife was? He knew. Okay, okay. But, okay. but he was like, he didn't know who the hell I was. Like, and the... he just looked at me. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Okay. John yeah. Jay. Jeez. It was easy for me to film because I was I was in Korea too. I taught English during the weekdays. And on the weekends, you know, I went to, I uh, my friends and I, we went to, there were other foreigners there. We went to like dance classes and tr- training sessions. And like, yeah, I would battle you know, at some of the local Korean events, and they're so freaking good. I would lose first round, and after, after I lose first round, I'm like, all right, I'm here already. Uh, Might as well get out the camera. Nice. <laughs> and that's just how I just started filming everything. Dang, okay. So then was it mostly just volunteer work for the most part? How, oh, it's how did, totally volunteer Okay, work. so did it what, – what was the next step in this strife transition journey? So, like, was there another big turning point where um, you became a bigger – contribution to strife because i heard i've I've heard in in the past is like at some point you know you were doing like a majority of the work strife of the strife work so how did that end up becoming i mean it's it's natural during stages of people's lives that they just become busy with other things and they just lose interest in certain hobbies Mm -hmm. and for me you know breaking was everything around me in korea so it was hard to get away from that and but my friends in the usa were like slowly transitioning out of it so it okay. eventually just ended up me being myself just providing the bulk of the strife tv video work mm, okay i see wow. and um and then you know i would recruit i would i in korea i recruited people like miss lee mm-hmm. i recruited other people to you know to help me there we're just because we're just friends along the way and then afterwards you know we we're like well we don't actually own strife mm-hmm. let's just create something of our own so that's how we made stance Ah, uh, okay so this is all happening in Korea, like the, no, the, the development. No, I eventually moved back to USA. Right. And then we created stands in the USA. Oh, so that was in 2014 you moved back or what year? Um, I moved back to the USA in 2010, 2011. 2010, 20. Okay, I see, I see. Yeah, after spending two years in Korea. Oh, okay. And then, you know, my 
I lived in Washington, D.C. I lived in Minnesota. Okay. You know, I just filmed things in my area. You know, I made good friends. I um, I filmed a lot for, like, Cross One. I filmed a lot mm-hmm. for Mex One from B-Boy Spot. You know, we decided to do I, – I eventually, you know, through, through the – the process of trial and error, my videography eventually got better mm-hmm. and better and better, especially for not having gone to school. Yeah, dude. So I would start to do things like instead of just filming battles, I would do things like short documentaries or interviews or just learning things along the way. I see. So what did you did you do? Did you have any type of teacher or instruction on this journey of you learning video? No. Wow. Seriously. I Damn. had YouTube. YouTube. YouTube free clutch. But yeah, that's, that's still very impressive, though, that you were able to get to where you are now you know with no mentor or anything i'm i'm glad people still watched back then because now i look back and i'm like why did i do that or why did i color it this way <laughs> or wow that was pretty bad was there? I, I thought that was pretty bad That's but funny. somehow people watched it so was there anybody else um around that time who were filming and posting battles on youtube like I regularly guess competitors if you want to call it that um, like 2009, strive, 2010 was also when yak films kind oh, of okay. appeared to the film uh, they were so you know you had them you had other videographers like um Antoine Shire mm-hmm. Tony Shire he's like from uh Style Touf from uh France okay that was still pretty not you know they had other people like Mason Rose back then mm-hmm. everyone had their own style mm-hmm. and you know Strife had its own style too so got it wow yeah. okay so there's something I, I noticed about stands because like you said there are people who entered uh this space with maybe more of a background with video like I, I, you can see it in yaks videos you know like right off the go right off the go you can understand like oh they understand how they're shooting they got composition and all this you started with like barely any experience but still somehow you are at the current moment like stance is almost it's almost unanimous that if you're a breaking event you want stance to cover you unless like they have their own maybe private thing but if people if if a breaker or an organization or a dance event wants their battles to be shown worldwide, it's dance they come to. And so there's really like a, not, I want to say monopoly, you know what I'm saying, but it's so obvious, you know, for, for people to choose that. And I, from what I observe, um, you know, uh, from stands, it seems like a lot of that is not just strictly on the quality of video, even though our quality is good, but there is so much more happening behind the scenes as, as someone as as running stands you know and so i wanted to maybe ask you a little bit more about what you think besides quality of video has allowed you to take this position as maybe um you know stance being at the caliber it is the reason why people think it's so big what what, what do you think makes stance different than everybody else uh two things uh quality and just being persistent in getting in and just filming and working at it and getting things online um like i said i started stance we started stance obviously 2014 with zero followers we just started a brand new page strife tv was still there and mm-hmm. there was like a couple people still left in strife mm-hmm. and they had like i i i left them with like 40,000 people on 40,000 followers on mm-hmm. you uh facebook and their you the stand the strife tv had like 200,000 already on youtube Jeez. like they had a huge head start mm-hmm. but you know, you need people to constantly film and just keep up with the work. And it's very easy to just not do it, mm. you know, and whether it's paid or not paid, you know, you just have to have like the the will to do it. You right. know, it's like going to practice or be on a or be on a good diet or going to a gym or anything. You just have to just just regularly do it. Right. And it's not the easiest thing. It's not the easiest thing. And I th- so I think for stance, just you know, myself, others that are in stance, we enjoy doing it. Uh, like I said, whether it's paid or not paid, we, we, we enjoy just showcasing our, our scene to the rest of the world. And so that's just how we regularly just get views and stuff along with good quality. Mm, okay. I think you kind of already addressed this question, but where does that will come from for you? Because, sure. I mean, you also, you don't just do stance. You, you also film weddings and industrially weddings is a huge industry you know like lucratively you know if you just did weddings you probably make more money than b-boy events right so you you have answered this but i do want to hear like a, a more in-depth answer from you like what allows you to be so persistent at this because 
um yeah it's it's really is there other things besides maybe you said because we like it i mean maybe you can elaborate more on that and other reasons too it's because you know my friends ever since college days are in the breaking scene you know really like the people that the friendships i made in the early 2000s mid 2000s are still with me to this day Mm -hmm. they're all my good friends and Mm -hmm. i always want to contribute one way or the other you know some contribute by battling by competing some people who contribute by organizing events you know my best skill was to contribute by you know filming or it started off contributing as filming and now has molded into like running social media channels and pages <laughs> like that's a totally separate work by yeah, itself if you think about it it is filming and doing social media management it is it's so and those are skills i picked up along the way too so it's just really just friendship like we us if you look at our stance group chats like the people internally we're just good friends we talk about fun stuff all the time (laughs) even whether it's not even related to breaking yeah you know and it's just for me it's like a good world outside of um outside of you know like corporate america outside of you know things like that not saying that it, it doesn't help taking a break too because it's like you know i would film like a wedding or i would film uh i would film like a travel video for like marriott and then they're like Oh, I have this dance page, <laughs> and they have no idea. You know, it's 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 a nice balance in life. Got you. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Hey guys, so they often say that you are the average of the five people you hang around the most with. So if you're looking for a community of people who will push you, who will help you grow, keep you accountable, and give you advice on career advancement, dance, professionalism, media creation, video production, any of that. I would highly recommend you check out our Movement Media Makers Discord group. The link will be in the show notes of whatever video you're watching, or if you're listening on podcast, it'll be in the show notes description. Take a look, and I hope to see you in there. Now back to the show. Okay, so I do want to ask you about, you you mentioned, and you, you kind of talked about how video and social media management are almost two separate things. So how, how, do you enjoy social media management or like like running your pages? Like... How, how is your, how do you feel towards those activities? Do I enjoy social media management? Um, it has its moments where I enjoy it. Okay. Uh, it's, it is challenging. Every year there's new challenges, both socially and both technically, mm-hmm. that you need to adapt to. You need to modify things to because truthfully, I mean, 10 years ago, this field never existed. Mm-hmm. So nobody has a degree. There's like no one you can really look up to like for advice. You just have to do it through trial and error. Um, but there are moments, for example, recently, like um, the, 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 the scene from Pakistan, mm-hmm. which I've never been to. Right. Uh, they're having a 10 year anniversary of their first breaking program. And they're like reaching out to me and they're like, can you give us a shout out? We would love if, you know, if we get recognition and just something small like that. And then I was like, Okay, not only I'll give you a shout out, you know, I'll post some stance, but let me hit up Kareem, let me hit up Kujo, let me hit up my other friends and have them give you a better shout out. Okay. I like doing small things like that, mm-hmm. you know, whether yeah. uh, as as much as I can and just to make, and, and they, they freaking love it. They're like, oh, Pakistan's on the board now, you know, just small things like that I, I, yeah. I like mm-hmm. because it brings the world together, which I never, you know, dreamed about when I first started, you know, t- t- um, things I don't like. Man, Facebook comes up with some <laughs> technical stuff that I do not understand every year. They'll take down pages. They'll take down music. They'll. It, it is very stressful, and it's. Uh, and every year you just have to, you know, maneuver around a bunch of new regulations and things, and just how can I keep this up? How can I keep you know yeah, have man. it keep working? You're you're doing most of this on your own, you know. Like now, now you we have a team. Thankfully, like it's not just you, so you can send people out like me to go help film events and edit battles. Um, but for the most part, you know, you're heading the charge. You're doing client relations. You are figuring deals out with people, and then on top of that, then you're scheduling, and then you're posting on social media, right? You're run, you're you're one of the main people running the stance page, right? Which posts pretty much daily, multiple times, almost a day, if not like at least once a day, right? So, so. How does, I'm, I'm so curious how you keep your days organized and get all of this done from day to day. Like, I have no idea. <laughs> it's weird because I've, um, I've worked with Red Bull before and Red Bull has an entire team 
and like schedules and like somehow some people view us on the same level as red bull and i don't know how that works Crazy. yeah dude. it's like i hide it pretty well or something because oh on our social stand social media most of the time is just me thinking i maybe i'll do this i think that's a good idea <laughs> oh my god so like do you do you do anything to like at least because you're, you're on your own but do you do anything like take notes or or make, make a calendar um like list your ideas down in a certain place and and like do you have some sort of system for for keeping all your thoughts in order lots of mental notes so everything's in your head lots like a lot of, of mental it. notes oh my god but on special projects like such as things that involve event weekends um things like that online activations things like that uh we do work in groups mm -hmm. and we do have like a more more calendar but like like weeks like today where they're in like you know in june where there's nothing going on uh, it's just stuff in my head crazy i man. had no idea what i was going to post last night until like maybe a couple hours ago prior. oh my gosh and then how do you usually find those posts? Do you usually just scroll through Instagram until something pops up? Or do you have a, do you have different types of places or techniques or methods that you like to like find what you're going to post today or, or tomorrow? Um, yeah. Sometimes I read the room. I, I read the room of what's going on. You know, like, recent, for example, recently Pakistan reached out to me. So I was like, mm -hmm. all right, let's see. Let me see if I have any footage from that area of the world. You know, Pakistan, India, you know, Middle East, Persia you know west asia that that area you know things like that just come up, comes up in my head okay I so see. or yeah what's like the average amount of time it takes for you to like from from finding from figuring out what you're gonna post to posting it like at this point how much time do you think you spend on average and now yeah 30 minutes really yeah That's and really sometimes <laughs> and, and but my mind goes uh, my mind um is always working so like even like mm -hmm. at 11 p.m at night right before i go to bed i think i would think of something and i'll like all right can't sleep now let me do this prep it up for tomorrow done or like you make a draft of it on instagram or whatever yeah yeah, oh, yeah. okay have yeah. you ever tried scheduling posts like using i have software like that okay. i don't like third-party software for mm. instagram and facebook just because i don't trust how it appears when it appears there have been mistakes before mm -hmm. so i prefer just to manually do it just to make sure there's no errors okay well 30 minutes is pretty good <laughs> especially like i don't know i feel like for me it takes forever just to come up with a caption and fi let alone find something so i guess it is true that repetition Definitely leads to, to productivity and, and increase in, in improvement for sure. Let's see. So we've covered, we've basically covered your story and how you've gotten mm -hmm. to where you are for the most part. Um, and needless to say, there you have a very, very unique background that I'd love to hear more about um, down the line. <laughs> it's just it's just so different. But at this point, uh, I guess since this is kind of like our space, right? And you you really enjoy posting good content, right? Bottom line. Um, when someone makes something good and it's like really it's really attractive or it, it, it rings well it, it it passes read the room test as you say like I guess for example Nasty Ray's like heels video we just saw recently right so stuff like that um, we it's good for us right when people are able to make good content so that's kind of the, the intention for this show is to kind of help other dancers or artists who are trying to make better content be able to record better post better you know like have better ideas. So I guess something I'd want to ask you is what, what, what is a common flaw, I guess you see in most your average dancers videos? Like what, is there something that you see? Is, do you have any type of like pet peeves you see? Like when you're like, Oh damn, like that would have been so good, but you just didn't capture it well or anything like that. Um, not really. Okay. I'm not, I don't like criticizing people or mm -hmm. seeing what's going wrong. I think, I think people just making content is like pretty damn good already because like that's the first step like that's the first step why there's not many channels like stance there or yak or stuff like that is because it takes a lot of effort just to make the content in the first place so i applaud them for that that's true okay that's a very good point yeah and the fact that yeah you're creating period yeah i mean that is definitely if there was mind. anything that i would say it would just be to just um, educate myself on the uh, on the formats mm -hmm. like Instagram obviously you have to know that it's better 4x5 right. or reels just have the general knowledge that reels get more views than than a post does right. and so if, like if I see like a wide post I'm like oh I could have gotten more views if it was like made for cell phone <laughs> but I mean that's just like nitpicky got you so yeah <laughs> do you have a favorite medium like a format like documentary or creating even if it's like 
just short little bits like i know you even you even made like you just recaps you know there's all types of different things do you have a favorite one that you like to make a favorite style or a favorite like type of video my favorite type of video is a video that I have not done for a really long time. Well, I do. I, I like making documentaries. I like making long-form documentaries. Mm. And I like making end-of-the-year recaps. Yeah. And I used to do those. Not anymore. so good. The portfolios? Those portfolios are fun. Mm-hmm. I wish I had the time to do more. <laughs> it's just, it just like... It just like I would start on them like the day after Christmas. And it'll last like four oh days. Oh, my God. And, I, and then I realized... Wow. Uh, and nowadays, like as I get older, I'm like, I kind of want to take those days off uh, and see friends or family and be mm. with family I'm like i can't do this anymore Jeez. but maybe there'd be another day i do it yeah um, cool those thing, are good because those are super they they make me happy they make i i know they make other people happy they like to see like the good like in things in the things that everyone does and i like those and i like i and i love documentaries especially on stories that um, empower people. So, mm-hmm. like, I did one on Somar. I did mm-hmm. one on Ayumi. Mm-hmm. You know, we have more coming. Awesome. Yeah, I I can't wait for the day that we bring more of those back. Um, you're definitely that's another reason. Like, and that's another unfortunate thing, right? Like, just because you're so busy and those projects do, do require a good amount of time, or for you to basically kill yourself for four days uh, between right after Christmas, Happy New Year. <laughs> um, but I mean, hopefully, the time will come where we can you know, um, delegate the responsibilities a little bit more. And it's just because those those videos are so effective. You know, they're so good. Uh, even, like, even we're talking about the Somar and Ayumi ones, like, bringing out, like, real stories, and they're well-made, you know, like, they're, they communicate the idea effectively. And because you understand how human attention works, like, that's your social media success, you're able to make videos that people will watch and continue to finish. And not only that, they have a good theme to them. Um, th- including the portfolios. It's such a great wrap-up of the entire year. It's mm-hmm. like the reason why people love like annual anthologies for their favorite music. They're like, oh man, it's a whole year in like 10 minutes. So, but needless to say, it's a whole year of content you have to put into one video and that requires a lot of editing, collection. So I understand. But I think it would be awesome to bring it back. So we'll put it out there. We'll think about it some more. You Would, would you edit the next one? <laughs> you know, I, I'd be down to try something at some point for sure. Uh, I, I would just need to take tutelage under you on how <laughs> how to best not kill myself while i do yep, that yep. Yeah, yeah yeah so for sure well we'll leave that open <laughs> um what, what is like a dream project for you in this current maybe in these next few years um well olympics are coming mm-hmm. uh i would love to that and that's a brand new audience mm-hmm. you know i i feel like i feel like through the years i've done a pretty good job balancing content for a, a dance centric audience and then a non-dance audience, you know, like I'm, I'm super happy, like like celebrities and Joe Rogan, people notice mm-hmm. us. I'm like, it's working. I, I want you guys to be excited about this just as much as breaker, not, breakers do. Mm-hmm. So the Olympics brings a whole new audience of just non-dancers, and I want them to be just as excited as we are. And so creating content for that, creating, you know, good content, getting people to recognize why people dance, why people are in this, what is hip hop? You know what, you know the the culture, the history of it. You know, um, that's something that I really, really want to do. Gotcha. That's perfect. There, there is. Needless to say, there are a lot of stories that need to be told, right? So, mm-hmm. are there any people that you're currently that you, like? If, are there dream people right now that you'd want to make? You know, maybe like a documentary out of at the current moment. Like off the top of your head. Uh, there's a bunch. Mm-hmm. Um. There's a lot, right? I, I'm not giving the ideas away. Yeah, true. <laughs> so but other people can. Needless, film it. needless to say, there are a lot, right? Yes. Almost to the point where there's always there's a, a lot of stories to be told in the breaking scene, and I think there's not a whole lot, there's not a whole lot of people who are doing it, right? It, so it takes work. It does take a lot of work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it takes a skill, right? So hopefully, that's something that people can learn more. I've learned so much from actually having the experience from you. I'm actually curious. Um, I want to ask you a story. Uh, from your past which is was there ever a project you that was extremely challenging but it was extremely rewarding for you can you think of any off the top of your head for you extremely challenging but extremely rewarding from you know for, from my videography days right yeah just from any videos you've made or projects that you've run yeah um wow i mean every every new year we do 
extremely challenging but extremely rewarding projects. Uh, I would say recently, you know, I I loved doing the 2019 2018 Rebel BC One USA's mm. because we stance was the live stream team, right? You know, like we were behind the cameras with like the headphone sets, just saying change to that angle, change to that angle. I mean, that's pretty badass because, like, 10 years ago, I was, like, mocking the camera operator for, like, some of these Red Bull stuff because we were like, <laughs> yo, why is there a camera way up there like, like, an, like an eagle, <laughs> you know? And we're like, Let, let's, we want angles. Like, I, I understand what people want. And we're like, man, if we were ever put in that position of running our own live stream, like, let's not fuck up. Let's, let's 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 make it like like a good viewing experience. Yeah. And so that was something that I was super proud of because that was really, really nicely viewed um online no complaints thank god yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah um, good and rebel trusted us mm -hmm. in, in producing that which i was super 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 happy about got you heck yeah it, yeah what so for that event you were were you operating a camera were you i was operating a camera mm -hmm. and then my team was not only operating a camera but they were directing in the back room with the switchers and like they were you know they were telling like which camera angle to select you know what to do with the audio uh, things like that. That's crazy, man. Yeah. yeah, we had we had you know it was it was it was a pretty nice team. We had like we had Ryan Porter mm -hmm. as our live stream you know director, yeah, who's also a b boy. We you know we had people within the scene directing our own things, which is freaking dope. That is really dope. Yeah, because yeah. I mean for past Red Bulls, like the BC ones, like the the older ones, the world finalists, those are. Red production. Bulls those are pro those are production companies. Oh, they're production companies. So okay. who may or may not have breaking experience. Jeez. Okay. Yeah. So that's really the strength here is that not only are you a production company, but you w we all come from some sort of background in breaking. Yeah. And so we're really like truly in house for the culture, and I think that gives us a very it gives us such, it gives us such an edge when we are creating, right? So when you know that. So is there anything? I also realize that you are not only you're not only married to breaking, but you also do enjoy other movements like tricking and open styles, correct? So, how did you kind of start getting interested in those, or what were what were some of your first projects in those spaces? So, how do we get started? Okay, so stance. Our passion is called the art of movement. Mm -hmm. It involves breaking, but it involves everything that breakers also have interest in. Mm -hmm. When we started stance through my through our friendships, you know, through other dancers and other people, we've discovered, you know, there are breakers that are trickers too. There are breakers that are skateboarders. There are breakers that are into gymnastics. There's breakers that are starting in martial arts and like living here in LA for the last six years, I've discovered like there's breakers that are into stunts. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. You know, like there's more breaking than people what what meets the eye. And so we wanted to show that aspect. Mm. We wanted to show that aspect. And um, and so, you know, who who knew that, like, the stunt double for Killmonger for, is a b-boy? Mm -hmm. You know, re most recently, who knew this, you know, MMA fighter was also a b-boy? You know, and those are the things that we know. And so I wanted to showcase, like, yo, these people are just like you. You that's can take so cool. your breaking skills and bring it elsewhere. And so that's why I like to show other different disciplines. Got you. Okay. Are there any other disciplines that you would like to film in the future as now? Because you've, you've already spread the tricking, open styles, and stunts. So anything else you got on your list that you're interested yes. in? Yes. Okay. So I lived in Africa for three years as a Peace Corps volunteer. Mm, three years. Wow. I didn't know Thanks. anything about filming back then. I film. I edited in Microsoft Movie Maker, and I had a <laughs> point and shoot cy Sony cyber cam. Yeah. I want to go back to Africa and film all the cool dances that I saw with an actual DSLR camera, oh. just a showcase. Did you see a lot of like of the native dances in Africa yeah. while you were there? Yeah. Well, I lived in so I lived in Mauritania and Senegal, which Senegal, is the West right. West Africa. Okay. And their dance style is super super unique, mm -hmm. and they would have they would dance for weddings, they would dance for baptisms, they'll dance for every single thing every single celebration in the world dang and so and it's cool and it's not it's not something that's very broadcasted to the world about you know like i feel nowadays when people see african dance they just group it all together and call it dance hall or afro dance and it's like right. yo every that continent is huge west africa <laughs> it is. is different than this and even within west africa every country dance is different that's true and so i would love to go back to africa and just spend more time there um, I still have lots of friends there mm -hmm. and just, just showcasing the stuff that they, they do. That would be super cool. 
So three years in Africa, that's crazy, man. So I guess I'll ask you a little bit more about that lifestyle. You know, like I'm, I'm really curious about what you learned while you were there. You know, like what were, what were some of like the biggest maybe like paradigm shifts or like mind shifts, you know, you saw there like we don't do here at all. And you're like, whoa, that's really interesting. In the Peace Corps? Um, in the Peace Corps and while you were living in Africa for three years. Just, just culture differences. Mm-hmm. Time goes different than there. Mm. You know, like if you get invited to a friend's house, you know, like, hey, come on over, let's have dinner. Oh, you're there for six hours. Oh. <laughs> that's, like, that's like the average amount of time you're going to spend. Yeah. Yeah. If you sometimes, you know, you people can't make it to certain things because they have different other priorities. And so it's just, yeah, just, it's just people's version of time just is different. You know, here in the USA, you know, we don't even have time to eat. You know, we have fast food. <laughs> right. In Africa, it's like you're spending the entire day there. And it might just be just sitting on the couch, just just waiting for the tea to come an hour or two later. And people just, you just like the presence of the other person there. Um, and that's where a lot of relationships, you know, trusted relationships are made. And so that's something I learned, you know, relationships take time mm-hmm. um, in Africa. Um, you know, sense of, you know, not, I, I lived, when I lived in Africa, I got paid $150 a month. That was the local salary. Wow. Jeez. 150 bucks a month. Gosh. And so it gave me a good sense of like, you know, how to survive off of something like that, how to live like other people do you know, how to save money, how to, you know, be be thrifty in different parts of the world. It really tests, you know, your, uh, it, it really tests a lot of different things. For real. Yeah. yeah. So that actually ties into something I wanted to ask you um, about, I guess, stance now, which mm-hmm. is you kind of have to start to learn more about how not only to film videos, social media, there's so many different aspects of running a, a, a company. Is that safe to call stance a company? Yeah. Yeah. So... Another one is client relations and also how to make it a living, right? So how, how has that process been for you, um, especially coming from a background where, you know, you you were living off a, a tenth of what minimum wage is here, you know? Um, is is that something that you've had to learn more about, like like finance in, in this company? I'm, I still am. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I still am, you know, I, I, when I, especially when I moved here to California six years ago, I had no idea about taxes. I was like, mm. whoa, that is so huge. You mean like they take this much amount? <laughs> I'm like, okay. Um, uh, yeah, just, 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 I guess just adulting, mm-hmm. I guess, yeah. you know, um, client relations, learning how to talk with clients, uh, managing those relations, uh, accounting, Mm-hmm. Um, things like that. Like everyone, all of us at Stance, we we do Stance. We work, I would say, part time at the most on Stance. Mm-hmm. Um, all of us have outside jobs. You know, like I film, I film for travel companies. I film from for hotels. I do weddings, and then in my free time, you know, or 11 p.m. at night, I do, I, I, I I do Stance. Yeah. You know, we have other people at Stance that like. That, that like that work on film sets and then they on their weekends they film for stance yep. the, the other people that like are coders for websites and mm-hmm. on their free time they'll do stance you mm-hmm. know we all contribute to this and our, this is kind of like our hobby but with like a, a bigger responsibility i guess right that's true <laughs> so that makes sense that that that's that's really funny that you mentioned that because yeah a lot of people when they, when I tell them that stance isn't like my full time job, like it's nowhere, not really. It's I like, wish it's like barely part time. But yeah, they're like really surprised. Like what? Like they they expect it to be something like this big because of the way it appears externally. So not bad for a side hustle, you know. Especially when people when, when you've grown it to this level. So I guess with that being said, like you said, you wish. Um, what are what what do you hope? What is your vision of stance in the future? Like what what do you want it to? Let's say. Five years from now, mm. a year after the Olympics happens, like ideally, if if you position yourself correctly and the right cards you play, then what would you like to see Stance as at that time? So Stance right now is a production company. Mm-hmm. Uh, we 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 create things, mm-hmm. whether it's live events, whether it's you know stories, things like that. We're a production company, um, and we have 
And but we also have a lot of、uh, viewers on social media. So we're a production company with some very active social media pages because people like to watch our stuff.、Mm-hmm. So it's it's nice because there's a lot of production companies who don't have a lot of viewers. They、yeah. just they just create. We、yeah. have we have both, which is、yep. we're really really fortunate about.、Um, what I would love for Stance to be is to be a production company for content creation. Uh, for the Olympics, whether it's through sponsors, whether it is for the Olympics, whether it's for events that revolve between now through the Olympics time, because I'm predicting that things are just going to get bigger and bigger, and bigger through 2024. I'm hoping,、mm-hmm. and that'll be a、yeah. success, and I'll keep on carrying out.、Um, you know, I would love for Stans to get,、um, you know. These, you know, I want the Visa commercial. I want the Samsung commercials. You know that because I, I, I trust us to film it more than like a production company in North Hollywood that has nothing to do with breaking.、Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, because you know them because we know the the stories that we tell, that are, that they're getting the proper people to you know to hit up. Um, and so yeah, th- these are my short term and long term goals. I I would have thought, you know, I I would have never thought it would have gone to this level.、Mm-hmm. I you know. Prior to this, and even nowadays, I'm still kind of on cruise control,、mm. <laughs> like just taking it one event at a time or one month at a time. Right.、Um, but because the Olympics are coming, it kind of gave me more of a long term, like I guess you can call it deadline, like 2024. Okay, I see that now. You know, if it wasn't for that, I would just, I would just, you know, just done it and just done it, you know, like what I do every month and every year, and just see what happens. Right. But now you have something to work towards. Which now is something you have something to work yeah, towards, which is、yeah. really great. You know, yeah. Because now this this creates this makes haste, and now hopefully we'll grow faster than before. Yeah.、Um, okay. We're closing up soon. I don't want to take too much of your time, Dan. No problem. Yeah. But、um, with building a bigger company or or like creating bigger projects and just doing bigger things, that typically requires you to grow as a company as well, right? So I'm curious what your philosophy or Thoughts and approach is to bringing new members on.、Um, I know for me, it's been, it's almost been five ish years, maybe, and it was. I think each person has a, a unique entry in a stance. Like there are some people who joined later than me, but became official before me. And then for me, I was in school still, right, for most for like three years, and then only graduated like two years ago. And it's only more recently, like post pandemic, that now you're beginning to like. Uh, what's it called? Launch me into like multiple places in one month. So I'm like, okay, here we go. Like, awesome. So,、um, in the event that this becomes bigger, like you know, we're covering more events, bigger budgets, you know, more stuff. What, how how would you? What would you say to people who are listening,、um, who may are interested, you know, in contributing somehow to stands in the future? What what kind of stuff do you look for in trying to bring on new people? We're、um, stance is always like. You know, I've always had my eye out for talent,、uh, for people that are willing to join, for people that are willing to contribute. The biggest thing is something similar to what I like, what I do, which is I, I want to see motivation. Self motivation、mm. is the biggest because you know anyone can say, "Oh, I can do this, I can do that," or "I can film an event," but then like, well, can you film five in a row without me telling you? Or like, even if it's a bad event,、mm-hmm. you know, like. Self motivation is the biggest thing because that's the reason you know stance exists is because we've been self motivated ourselves the last six years to keep it going. You know, it not not every day is going to be like a Red Bull BC one final. There's going to be like days in February where you're like, okay, what can we what can we do now? You know, downtime and so self motivated creative individuals.、Um, every year, there's brand new things that we discover like. Four years ago, we had no we had no idea how to do live stream.、Mm-hmm. Live streams are totally like four years. Ago, our, our our first live stream thing was like a Mevo camera on a、yeah. on a tripod with a bunch of tape around it. We had no yeah, idea that. how that live stream worked, but, but it did. Nowadays, we got switchers and things like that. Like, so every year, just you just have to like keep up with technology, learn what's new. Even social media wise, like what kind of content to to create,、um, it's not the easiest thing.、Uh, so self motivated, you know, just 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 the eager to learn that and to work as a team and part of the group、um, is something you know that we look for. And I would totally welcome like more companies like Stance、mm-hmm. 
-hmm. like I said, it's it's been strife, us, mm -hmm. yak, B and C. I mean, totally welcome more. It's just you just have to do it, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. That's good advice. Yeah, that's actually very good advice. So, I mean, you heard it from Dan. You know, if uh, if you want to get down, then you have to find your reason why internally, and that will drive you and, and motivate you. So, I mean, for me, um, yeah, I, I guess I have my own reasons. Dan has his own reasons. So, let's say you, there's a there's a there's a college student who knows that they want to contribute more. Mm -hmm. I, and I'm asking this question because I've been in a similar place or a high school or college student who says they want to contribute more, they're interested in the media space. Um, are there any resources that you point them to? Like maybe what are some things that helped motivate you or, or gave you kind of like the tools or or thoughts to like really push you forward? I don't know if you read books or like watch movies or anything, but would you have any to recommend? Um, thoughts on how to start or to move forward or move forward creatively to kind or of like something? Find, to find their why i don't know if that makes sense try if it's just me just trial and error mm -hmm. find something that you like enjoy creatively create something similar um you know on your own see if you like it if you don't well move on to the next thing just just trial and error um i didn't even realize i liked travel videos until like six years ago mm -hmm. and then i was like and I met friends that did travel videos. I'm like, well, this is fun. And now I have like, outside of stance, I have like travel video friends around the world that do similar things, um, you know, that I met. And like, I managed to hit up some popular ones on Vimeo. I'm like, you know, I asked them questions. Like, how did you do that? How'd you do that? Mm -hmm. And we met up and I showed them my world. They showed me theirs. It's nice cross-cultural stuff. That's really cool. Lots of, so it's lots of, lots of trial and error. Mm -hmm. um, and also know that people like me, other people similar to me are always available for any like questions. I, I love, I have, I have people hit me up all the time. You like asking for like career advice or things like that. And I always answer back. Wow. Um, so yeah, there's lots of trial and error. See what you like. And if you don't like it, just keep on going to the next one. And also if you like it, try a different style, try, there's so many, I mean, I didn't learn how to, I didn't, didn't go to school for video. I just learned it. Mm -hmm. And then I just, trial and error on my video skills and um yeah just do it i think doing it is the first step right it's the biggest step is yeah. to keep doing it got it yeah and that's i mean even though it sounds simple it's it's the truth and i guess to put it another way it's really if you if you want to boil it down then you can almost argue that the reason why trial and error is so helpful is because we almost have to get like quote unquote lucky to find something that really clicks with us and sometimes that shows up earlier in people's lives and sometimes it shows up later. But the fastest way to guarantee you find that is by trying as many things as you can until you hit something that clicks with you, right? So, I mean, taking those opportunities that are given to you, like when Dan was given the opportunity to film by his friends and it clicked, right? And then when you continue to have the opportunity to start live streaming, you're interested. I mean, fuck it. All we know how to do is tape a camera to a stick for now, but maybe this could turn into something. And before you know it, you are taking over the broadcast for Red Bull BC1. And that wouldn't have happened if you didn't pursue it and try it. So I understand what you're saying. Yeah, it's similar yeah. to like like uh, what you do FPV drones right. now. Yeah. Did you have a teacher? YouTube. There you go, yeah. trial and error. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So you just got to get lucky and lucky, quote unquote. Um, find the thing that clicks with you. Really just keep trying those things. And that's a great piece of advice. And like you said, like, like Dan said, uh, I mean, thank you for being open. So if you have a good question or, of course, be respectful of Dan's time because he is a very busy man. But still, <laughs> um, if, if you do really want to reach out, something calling to you, then Dan has said it himself. So I'll plug a few of our and Dan's um, social medias that you can follow and potentially message. So there's Sans Elements, right, on Instagram. There's, is it just Stans on YouTube? Yeah. Dot stance or just stance. Just yeah. stance, yeah. Just look up stance, maybe B boy next to a keyword, and then you'll find it. Um, stance elements on Facebook. And anything else, Dan, that you'd nope. like to plug? Those are the top three. So, yeah, guys, uh, this has been a very special talk and very insightful. Thank you, Dan. This has been awesome. And I want to affirm you one more time for well, taking the time to do this, but also for being so willing. I know it's intrinsic to a point because your friends are a part of this scene mm -hmm. and you want to just be with your friends. But a lot of people in the breaking scene 
are here because of their friends but not everyone contributes something so giving you know so it i, I understand you i'm affirming you for all the work you put in and it's, it's amazing stuff i hope you know that and i hope uh, it, it helps you continue pushing uh i know you're very intrinsically motivated which is great but at the same time just letting you know that uh if it weren't for your the work you did then i definitely would not be doing half of the stuff i'm doing today because you kind of gave me my first opportunity to really step into the real world and so i appreciate you for that and i hope this this type of thing helps others to take that step too so yeah thanks again definitely thanks kai yeah of course man cool yes. all right guys this has been kai and stance a movement media mentor podcast thank you for listening you're actually the very first guest i totally forgot to mention that oh there you go yeah so thank you for <laughs> being the first guest amazing first guest all right guys all right till next time See take ya. care peace Hello, my friend. It is Kai again, and thank you so much for watching another episode of the Movement Media Mentor Podcast. I genuinely hope that this episode brought you a lot of value you can implement into sharing your greatest movements. And if you liked it or if you have any feedback, I would highly, highly appreciate it if you took a look at whatever platform you're listening to on, whether it's YouTube or Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Anchor, you name it. Leave a feedback, leave comments, review it, rate it five stars. All of it helps. And if you are interested in pushing your movement media journey forward, whether that is creating a career as a dancer or making more films or finding your way into the industry or building your own platform, I would highly recommend you check out our movement media mentorship. And this is where you will get one-on-one -on -one guidance from myself and other students and teachers and professionals in the industry who will give you one-on-one -on -one pointers as well as a full course database on a bunch of topics that you can learn from, including pre-production, storyboarding, or even building a social media account. So if you are interested, then take a look at movementmediamentor.com. And I would love to see you in there. If not, thank you for listening and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.